But first up, it should surprise no one at this point that Donald Trump might cherry pick facts to best support his agenda, averaging around 15 false or misleading statements a day, with more than 20,000 in all since he took office by the Washington Post's latest count. But when it comes to his push to get kids back into classrooms in the middle of a still raging pandemic, Trump is enlisting some company like Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator Dr. Deborah Birx. A new report from The New York Times found she and other top White House officials pressured the CDC over the summer to focus only on data that supported the push to send kids back into classrooms. In an email obtained by The Times, Birx asked CDC Director Robert Redfield to include data from an organization called the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which emphasized the need for kids to go back to school and downplayed the risk of them either getting or spreading the virus. And while the mental health impacts of distance learning on kids are a valid concern, CDC scientists told The Times they found numerous errors in the documents she shared. But despite their objections, the gist of the argument Burks was pushing ultimately made it into the agency's final policy. The Times reporting seems to align with accusations that have been coming from a former White House staffer, Olivia Troy. She's a former Homeland Security Advisor to Vice President Mike Pence, who also served in the Coronavirus Task Force. She says she quit last month because she felt like she was helping to mislead the public to help the White House politically. I would get blindsided where there would be junior staffers being tasked to find different data for charts that would show that the virus wasn't as bad for certain populations, ages, or demographics. He told the governors, you, know, you, need, to open, you need to open the schools. You need to go, you know, try to make it seem like everything's okay, when in reality it's not. Still, most school systems around the country are operating with hybrid learning models, with cities and towns deciding if, when, and how often kids should go to school in person. So far, there have been a relatively small number of outbreaks in schools across the country, but some experts are warning a full surge in cases could change that. And in this state, some are worried we're already starting to see that rise. Last week, the number of new daily cases hit 554. That's the highest total since May. Hospitalizations for the virus are at their highest level since mid-August. We have more people in intensive care than we've had since July 4th. And while state officials keep touting the overall case positivity rate, which is averaging just under 1 percent, some experts say that figure can be misleading because so many asymptomatic people are being tested multiple times per week now at colleges and other institutions. In fact, when you stop looking at just the tests, and look only at the number of people tested, the state's positivity rate is much higher, topping 4% this week. And when you couple that with the fact that the state is easing up on even more restrictions, some are starting to sound the alarm about where we're headed. After further relaxing some restaurant rules yesterday, Governor Charlie Baker announced today that communities deemed, quote, low risk will be allowed to move into another phase of reopening next week meaning performance venues and entertainment spots like roller rinks, laser tag, and trampoline parks can open back up at 50 percent capacity. The order also lets gyms, museums, and libraries increase capacity to 50 percent in those areas. Retail stores can reopen their fitting rooms, and as many as 100 people will be able to gather outside in public. Overall, we've seen significant progress statewide in our effort to contain COVID-19. We've ramped up our public health resources to the point where we're now outperforming most other states in the country. Our testing capacity has greatly improved overall and has climbed to unprecedented levels. But is that enough? I'm joined now by Dr. Nahid Bedalia, an associate professor at Boston University School of Medicine and an infectious disease physician at Boston Medical Center. Doctor, it's great to see you again. Thanks for being here. Tim, good to be here. So the percentage of tests that are positive, as I say, seven-day averages hover just under 1%. But when you look at the number of people who have tested positive, it's as much as four and a half times that high. Is that concerning to you? 
It is, Jim. I think there are a couple of elements to this. As you said, you know, test positivity, which is one of the indicators that the state is using, and that's basically the number of people who are positive and the denominator of the number of people who are getting tested. If you just increase the number of people tested, including people who are getting this multiple times, you're going to artificially decrease, you know, that that positivity. And the one the worry is that it might hide a real increase. And then, as you said, the hospitalizations uh, seem to be going up. And I can say that from personal experience. We're you know we're seeing that uh, potentially more people being admitted than they were in August. The the other part of this is we just started schools and universities, and and we don't know how this will play out as we move into the fall. And the concern nationally in the fall has been respiratory viruses and coronaviruses in general, you know, transmit with greater proficiency in, in colder weather. There is clearly a pandemic fatigue, you know, that's setting in. And the fact that we, we might actually see these two viruses co-infect. There was a study in the Lancet last week, influenza and SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, which basically showed that if you get the flu and COVID-19, your chances of dying are twice as high as if you just got COVID-19 and five times higher than if you got neither one of them. And so all of those things carry the risk of what happens if we don't stop a potentially rising trend in time. So you say if we don't stop a potentially rising trend, I was speaking on the radio with the governor of Rhode Island today who has paused reopening at the current level for an additional month. As you know, a number of countries in Europe experiencing similar things, pausing their reopenings as well. We are not here in Massachusetts. Are we making a mistake? I'm worried because, uh, yes, so I will start with that. Um, I, I feel that we need to hold at where we are because we don't know what's going to happen in the upcoming months. And so I'm also looking at the national data. If you look at the, the increases in the cases, the seven day increase of 14 day, the 14 day average and seven day averages are both up, you know, um, and the test positivity nationally has gone up from 4.3 to 6 percent in, in a week and a half. We're, we're seeing something different. It's not like what we saw in the spring and the summer where you had this regionalized, you know, hyper hot spots in the northeast and then the south and then the west and the midwest. You're seeing a lot of states report this. And, and we don't know what happens when we have this generalized increase in cases in a nationalized pandemic, because then we're all competing for the same personal protective equipment, same testing capacity, um, you know, or at least the same reagents for the testing capacity that we have held up here. Um, so for all of those reasons, I, I would agree with caution of holding where we are. So uh, you, an expert, urge caution like many similarly situated people do. But the person sitting at home is say, says, wait a second. The FDA approved hydroxychloroquine under pressure for emergency use and then had to withdraw it because it was risky. Uh, uh, the president doesn't tell the truth about anything. His chief advisor, Dr. Atlas, says, don't worry about masks. And then, as I said a minute ago, Dr. Burks, who at least used to be the head of the coronavirus task force, uh, is exposed this morning, is trying to put pressure on the CDC to change their recommendations about school reopenings. And what do they do? They change their recommendations about school reopenings. So how do you convince the average, understandably skeptical person that you do need to be cautious, you do need to be patient, you do need to be careful. Yeah, Jim, I, I, I think you've hit what's ailing our pandemic response nationally. You know, we've there is this trend. You've, we've seen this administration, members of the some members of the task force, the COVID-19 task force, be pressured. Basically, you're seeing watering down a history of watering down all CDC guidances. Um, you know, all you all you have to do is look at the milestone that we just passed one million deaths from COVID-19 globally. Mm. And the WHO yesterday says that that's probably an underestimate because we don't really have a good sense of access mortality um, globally. You know, it, it, I, I think that what we need is 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 to keep pressuring to have the CDC scientists up front. We need more reputable bipartisan sources coming out to make sure that we use science as the basis of going up. But if none of that convinces people, let's put it this way. The choices that we're making is we wanna have our kids in school. We wanna continue colleges. And, and so right now, if lowering or keeping the cases lower ensures that our kids stay in school, isn't that the right strategy? You know, you mentioned a minute ago the, the overlapping of the seasonal flu and COVID-19. I assume because of this decline of trust, I heard a poll the other day, far larger than the 
I'll be respectful, the nuts and the anti-vax movement. A third of Americans say they're not even going to have their kid or themselves vaccinated for the seasonal flu. Speak to those people and tell them how important it is. And by the way, good for Governor Baker, in my estimation, being the first governor to mandate that kids in school get the seasonal flu vaccine if they want to attend. Speak to those people, doctor. Yeah, Jim, I think as opposed to the conversation that we're having about COVID, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine and the politicization around its release, you know, I do hope we have an effective vaccine. And when it comes out, the data is clear and we can say with good faith, let's, you know, this is safe, let's do it. The flu vaccine is something that we've had a lot of experiences with. You know, the efficacy is different year to year, but this year is more important than any. When when someone comes in with flu-like symptoms into the emergency room, every year you have sort of this burden of hospitalization and death that occur from from the flu, right? This year, when people come into the emergency room, we will have no way to differentiate who mm. has COVID-19 and who has the flu. So that people are the same folks are competing for those beds for that personal protective equipment. By taking the vaccine, you're reducing your chances of getting the flu and passing it on to others who are vulnerable who may end up in the emergency room. By taking it, you're ensuring you don't get the disease. You know, one thing that I'm sort of worried about that we thankfully haven't had much data about yet, but I'm worried we don't know what happens when people survive COVID-19. We're seeing that if, if they have a particularly severe course, you know, they get this impact on their lungs. Does, they, mm -hmm. does, that, does that mean they'll have a more severe course of the flu after they survive, you know, not together, but even after they survive. For all those reasons, now is the time um, to, take, to take the flu shot uh, so that we can decrease the community transmission of at least the one preventable disease that we know. From your lips to their ears, Dr. Bedelia, it's great to see you again. Thanks so much for your time. You too, Jim.